everybody hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Great. Welcome to the PID webinar, to the PID. And now today we are collaborating with the World Bank. We thank World Bank for a lovely collaboration. We're going to collaborate on exports. We did one earlier. I must thank Gonzalo for uh, this idea and for sponsoring this. Thank you, Gonzalo. Um, and we will proceed to talk about non-tariff barriers and exports. I've been thinking about non-tariff barriers. What are non-tariff barriers? Although I think the speakers will explain that to you very well. We've got a good bunch of speakers here. We've got uh, Dr. Smith Sreshtha, market analyst from the International Trade Center. We've got Adil Nakhoda from the in, from IBA in Karachi. We've got Dr. Manzoor Ahmed from uh, um, uh, you know well-known Dr. Manzoor Ahmed. He's worked with us before. He's been in the internet. You can say from Pied. Right now from Pied, exactly. Very good idea. But he's been everywhere. He's been the, you know, the ambassador in uh, um, WTO. He's done many important positions. But now, yes, he is with Pied indeed. Then we've got um, Afaiza Sulmekan, Chief International Customs. Um, and then, of course, we've got Gonzalo and the World Bank people. So we will proceed to... Um, the webinar. But let me say, what is a non-tariff barrier? The way I look at it is non-tariff barrier. We've got so many of them here. Um, like, for example, there's a huge number of non-tariff barriers in opening, opening a bank account in Pakistan. All our documentation is a non-tariff barrier or a non-price um, uh, uh, barrier to doing business in Pakistan. And we've got so many of them. I had to do something recently and I had to photocopy my credit, my ID card about 10 times, get it attested by 10 different officials, and then go to different documents, to collect different documents. And this is all for Nadra, which is supposed to be a highly, highly uh, computerized organization. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is very easy for all Pakistanis to understand because we've got a huge amount of non-price barriers everywhere. We don't do business without doing documentation, but that, um, uh, I think I'll come to Gonzalo. I think, Gonzalo, that is a bit of a problem, and you have to talk about that. Gonzalo, would you like to begin? And then we pass on to Dr. Samir Sarishta. So let me just say uh, that I'm, I'm very, uh, very happy to have this collaboration ongoing with Pyle. Uh, on behalf of the World Bank, it's a, it's a, it's a very good thing to be able to, to partner with such an organization, and it's very good to get these topics uh, to be discussed. Uh, related to, to export competitiveness, competitiveness more in general. Uh, the first session was a kickoff a couple of weeks ago, uh, very successful, and now uh, we go into more specific areas. Uh, also very happy to have Samir uh, presenting uh, from the, the International Trade Center and to have such a great panel. Uh, so I'm not going to say anything, anything else than that. So look forward to the discussion and the presentations. Okay, Dr. Samir. Over to you, Dr. Samir Shreshta, International Trade Organization, uh, International Trade Center. Uh, Dr. Sab, over to you. Hello, Dr. Nareem. Thank you very much for the introduction. And hello, Gonzalo. Uh, nice to see you as well. Uh, can you hear me, everybody? Just to make sure. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, a very good evening to our esteemed panelists today and also to all the participants uh, in this webinar. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to be here present today to present part of our work in Pakistan that we did together with the World Bank. And I would like to thank the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics for the invitation. Uh, so maybe if I may just share my screen so that I can uh, present the results of the survey. Just one second, please. Uh, uh, just want to check, uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes sir, we can okay. see. All right, so let me begin my presentation. Uh, basically, uh, oh, you are seeing the slides, right? Uh, just to make sure you're in this correct screen, or are you seeing the browser? No, no, we are seeing the slide. We've got a slide. Okay, change. thanks. Cool. Okay, uh, so basically, two weeks ago, I also attended this very, very interesting webinar on the export led uh, growth, uh, which is organized by PID and World Bank. And uh, I was very fascinated to hear the interesting views of uh, very qualified 
panelists on how to improve export competence of Pakistan and what are the constraints. Uh, they were like some very good discussion about uh, why <coughs> Pakistan is not emulating the success uh, Vietnam has and what can be done to do those things. Uh, so one of the issues that was touched upon was the factors hindering Pakistan exports growth, and this was related to non-tariff measures and market access. So basically, non-tariff measures is like a really important issue uh, over here. So to begin off with, as Dr. Nadim said, what are exactly uh, non-tariff measures? Uh, so the way we define it uh, is like basically non-tariff measures are any government regulation. These are mandatory in requirement. Uh, and these are regulation other than customs tariff. So any uh, regulation related to export or import of goods uh, besides customs tariffs, we consider this as non-tariff measures. So basically these are mandatory regulation and they can influence the quantity or the price of the goods being traded. Uh, having said that, uh, basically NTMs include a whole constellation of uh, regulation. Uh, some of them may be easy to comply for exporters, some of them might not be so easy. So basically it's not very uh, straightforward to determine the exact impact of non-tariff measures on, uh, on trade. So basically that's why also we call it like the invisible barriers to trade. Uh, so, that is one of the reasons we wanted to, we, we collaborated with the World Bank to see what are exactly this impact for exporters with related to non-tariff measures. So our program falls under the Pakistan uh, Trade and Investment Policy Program, which World Bank is connecting with the Ministry of Commerce with the government of Pakistan. So the key objective here is to have a holistic understanding of the ground realities. What are the constraints? What can be done about it so that we can contribute to a very uh, evidence-based policy-making process. So that's the background behind this. Before I actually go and present the results of the survey, uh, I did a quick research about NTM, different types of NTM studies that has been done in relation to Pakistan's trade, and I come up with several different uh, researches. And so I just am highlighting uh, different examples. So I thought like it might be interesting to first give you an overview of different types of NTM data avail uh, available right now so that we do not confuse with one type of research with others. So to start off with, uh, I see three main types of NTM data available, which are in cross country, uh, which can be uh, available for multiple countries. So first source, which I see is about SPS and TBT notification. So under the SPS and TBT agreement with the WTO, uh, countries are obliged to report any new regulation they uh, introduce to the fellow members. So this information is available in uh, WTO and ITC databases, and it covers uh, only SPS and TBT regulations. So basically, if you are following NTM research, you might have come across charts like this, where they explain the growing role of non-tariff measures. So they show the number of notification that has been made to the WTO, which has been rising uh, every year to show the importance of non-tariff measures in current uh, trade right now. So this is regarding SPS and TBT notification, and this is limited only to technical regression. The second type of data, uh, which is also prevalent and hugely wide in research is uh, what we call regulatory mapping. So basically it's a review of the country's regulation uh, and we map it to the country and products uh, related to that regulation. So this will give you a coverage of different types of NTM uh, applicable to different products or countries. And this is also available in the ITC, UNCTAD and World Bank databases. So this is a joint initiative that we have done with other agencies. Uh, so the issue about these two databases is that it'll tell you what regulation exporters have to follow, but it does not necessarily tell you which of these regulations are burdensome for the exporters. So to identify which regulations are difficult for exporters, what we did was we directly went and asked the exporters, what are the difficulties? And that's where we come with the business survey, the database. So we talk to exporters and identify what are the burdensome NTM, uh, burdensome NTMs they actually face. So which brings us to our story today, uh, which is about NTMs, which uh, we have done in over 70 countries and now which we are doing in Pakistan. 
So to start off in Pakistan, uh, before we started the survey, we needed to know what the uh, export climate is like, and uh, not the climate, sorry, that's the wrong word, but rather the type of export is present and where they are present. So basically we see uh, when we accumulated all the databases of exporters, we had around 12,000 active exporters in Pakistan. And most of them were concentrated in two provinces, in Punjab and in Sin. And when we classified them according to the different sectors, we see that most of them are in the manufacturing section, less than 20% of them are in the agricultural sector. And the way we uh, implemented the survey was to get a representative uh, results by sector. Uh, so basically, when we did the survey, we tried to cover most of the geographical region, and at the end, we ended up with around 1,200 uh, interviews with exporters. Most of them were export exporters, but there were also around 400 uh, companies that were importing or raw materials for their products. In addition, we engaged with like business association and also with stakeholders to get a more comprehensive understanding of the pro problem. Now I'm trying to, I'll try to explain some of the difficulties uh, that Pakistani exporters face. Uh, we got a lot of responses from exporters on the difficulties and it is not possible to explain each and every issue in detail. So I will be staying more at the surface level and showing you some of the key issues present at the aggregate country level. So the way we explain the difficulties, you can three in three dimension. The first dimension is about effectiveness, that is to say, how many companies are facing difficulties. Uh, and you can look at it by different uh, criteria, by sector or size of the company. So how many companies from agriculture sector, how many from manufacturing, this kind of uh, issues can be seen. So in general, at the country level, we have seen effectiveness in some countries in, let's say, in West Africa to be as high as 95% and as low as around 30% in countries like in the EU and in the Caribbean. Once you find this effectiveness rate, the next thing is uh, to know what are the different types of NTMs that uh, exporters experience as burdensome. Uh, are they technical in nature, non-technical in nature? Are they only about processes, Those, this kind of information? And finally, we want to know in detail, why are they deemed burdensome? Is it because the regulations itself are, di are difficult or is it the process of complying with the regulations are the main cause of the problem? So together they give you a comprehensive understanding of the situation in the ground. So moving on to the results, uh, the main, one of the first thing we see is among the exporters, the affected rate is around 51% uh, overall in across sector. Where does this fit uh, when we compare in the regional average? So this is slightly higher than the average that we've seen in other Asian countries, which is around 47%. So when it comes to South Asia, we have also done the similar surveys in Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka as well. So, and other Pacific countries as well. So basically it's slightly higher than the Asian average, but lower than the things in, uh, in African region. When we break it down by sector, we see the companies in the agricultural sectors are facing uh, more difficulties, like more uh, companies in the agricultural sector face difficulties with non tariff measures compared to manufacturing. Uh, and like if we go at the product level, you see, especially the exporters of fresh food products are facing difficulties, like, pro uh, like exporters of, let's say, meat products or exporters of fruit and vegetable products, they are one of the more affected ones. And this is not very unusual re result because we know, especially if, uh, fresh food exporters, they have to comply with a whole range of safety and uh, quality requirement, the SPS requirement, especially when you're exporting to uh, countries like in the Europe and uh, in Australia and uh, EU, uh, you really have to uh, meet a lot of these SPS requirements. Now the interesting part for over here is what are the types of regulation? So first of all, let's divide it by the origin of this regulation. And here, this is something very interesting. You see around 45% of the difficult regulation which exporters face are actually originating in Pakistan itself. They're facing difficulties with Pakistani regulation. 55% are difficulties with 
foreign regulation, the buyer country regulation in most cases, and 45% in Pakistan regulation. And this is a very uh, unusual uh, case when it comes when you compare with other countries. Uh, for instance, if I show you the results from uh, another nine countries that we have done in Asian uh, continent, you see only 20% of the difficulties are related to domestic problems. In the case of Pakistan, it's 45. That's quite a lot of uh, issues with uh, domestic problems. And also, I remember uh, two weeks ago, there was a lot of discussion about comparing Pakistan and Vietnam, like how can uh, Pakistan emulate uh, Vietnam success and all stuff. And it's interesting because right now we are also doing the survey in Vietnam. So I just compared some of the results what we have in Vietnam. And you see, in the case of Vietnam, only 11% of the problems are related to domestic issues. So you can see a big contrast uh, between Pakistan and Vietnam. So hardly any problem with domestic regulation in Vietnam and quite a significant lot of problems related to domestic problems in the case of Pakistan. Uh, moving on, uh, if you look at by country level, uh, quite a lot of the foreign regulations which Pakistani exporters face are originating from Asia and Europe. So now this is the more important part of the presentation, like what are the different types of NTMs they actually face. So we have classified the responses of uh, the exporters by the international classification on NTMs, which we use for all our databases. So basically there are two main uh, outcomes that we see. One of them is obviously 45% are related to domestic problems, but another major chunk of problems comes from technical uh, regulations. This are the technical requirement or conformity assessment. So this basically, these are very product specific requirement which are intended to ensure the quality or the safety of the products. So that together make up on, on the 45% of the problems. And in general, we see that uh, the companies are not really complaining that the regulations are too difficult, but rather about conformity assessment, which means proving compliance to those technical requirements through the process of testing or certification process, that is the main hurdle for the companies. When I break it down by sector, the difference is also quite evident. You can see in the agriculture sector, almost 60% of the problems are related to uh, the uh, what you call certification and testing requirement. And in the case of manufacturing, majority of the problems are related to domestic issues. I will be moving on to the domestic issues uh, in a bit, but just to give you some of the examples uh, of what are these problems uh, which foreign regulation company face. So example with, for in the case of fruits and vegetables and rice exports, like, you know, uh, food exports, they are issues with uh, maximum residue limit testing or pesticide testing. So the test which has been done in Pakistan, either not reliable, uh, so they have been shipments have been rejected or that uh, smaller companies, uh, they have faced problems regarding costs, especially when you need it for every shipment, uh, the cost accumulates for them and they are not able to absorb the cost. Uh, in some products, they have also been complained that the test which has done in PCSIR, uh, Pakistan Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, they are not able to cover all the parameters of the test which are required by the buyer countries as a result, Exporters normally they have to send the product abroad to get this tested, which adds to additional time and cost for the producers or for the exporters. Uh, for the fresh food uh, as well, like you know, there's issue of long waiting times for the Department of Plant Protection to certify the products for sanitary sanit sanit certificates. Uh, for rice exporters, they have been also issue about the GMO testing that the laboratories over here are not very well equipped. Uh, for meat exporters, there's been issue about high antibiotic residues, which has led to a lot of uh, export rejection and difficulty in accessing markets. Uh, there's also issue about halal certification, so the fragmented nature of the certification system in Pakistan. Uh, so different countries require different types of halal certification and the companies are not very well aware of what are these different requirements and how to get them. Another important issue for the live animals and meat exporters is about traceability. Basically, uh, without knowing the origin of the product, it's almost impossible to export to 
major markets such as the EU and the US. So basically, uh, the Pakistani exporters, they are kind of limited to the GCC market for export of meats. Although they would like to export to the EU, uh, it's not going to be possible without having a traceability system in, the, in place. Uh, when it comes to textile and garments and on the manufacturing, there were issues about dyes, need to use azo free dyes and environmental friendly dyes. This kind of issues have been widely reported. Uh, another important issue, maybe we can discuss this later, is uh, this has not come up in the interviews with the exporters, which we did last year, but the issue about intellectual, intellectual property, and I think this is relevant in the current context, because as you may know, uh, right now, uh, we have uh, this story going on about India applying for geographical indication for basmati rice to be sold in Europe. So if that happens, that can actually impact Pakistani exporters a lot because they cannot export their rice to Europe as basmati rice. So this is a potential big NTM hurdle for Pakistan and uh, this must also be looked into. Uh, moving on, uh, the type of problems face uh, applied by Pakistan. So as you know, I indicated 45% problem of, of the problems reported are domestic in nature, uh, related to Pakistani regulation. And over here, I'd like to highlight two things which are um, major issues. So one of them is regarding export inspection. So when they're doing the export process, first of all, they say that there is not enough, uh, let's say cold storage facilities, which uh, damages like the fresh food products. That's an issue for exporters. Another issue is about the lengthy time that involves export inspection. So basically in the export process, three major institutions uh, involved, the Pakistan Customs, the Anti-Narcotic Force for inspection, and also like the terminal port terminal authorities. So for exporters, it's not straightforward to pinpoint where the delay occurs, but they just know, they just know that in the export process, there's quite a bit of delay if there is some kind of inspection. Uh, from the side of customs, we know that there is some staff shortages involved and also there is like lack of scanners, uh, which leads to manual inspection taking place. So this leads to quite a lot of delays for exporters and they've been complaining quite a lot about that. Another aspect is when the products are open for manual inspection, uh, there's been a lot of complaints that the products the, are not packaged properly and they have been rejected when they choose the buyers. So these are some of the issues regarding export inspection. And from the custom side that we talked to as well, there has also been reported issue that uh, the exporters, the way they pack is not of uh, good quality and they have sometimes been substandard uh, packaging. So basically they needs, there needs to be a way to inform uh, exporters on how to do better packaging. Uh, Another aspect over here is about the export tax refund or let's say like the duty refund. So there are a lot of exporters who are also importing raw material to be uh, used as export uh, on the export, exported products. Uh, and they've been reported cases that this process is taking uh, way too long. Uh, and there've been many reasons. Some of them say like, you know, the, there's not enough staff in the State Bank of Pakistan or to say the government itself doesn't have enough funds. And in some cases, the government are not very convinced about the documents provided by the companies. So there's a lot of verification back and forth. And overall, for some companies, it can take a few years before they actually uh, get to see the money. Uh, I see that I'm running a little bit uh, late. So basically, I'll try to wrap it up now. Uh, the third aspect which we see is why are these problems being deemed burdensome? So in 70% of the cases, it has nothing to do with the regulations being too strict. So the companies that are fine with the regulation, they can comply with it, but they say the process involved is tedious, which leads them to having difficulties with non-tariff measures. So we call this problems with procedural obstacles or procedural hindrances. Uh, and delays and high fees are some of the most prominent procedural obstacles that the exporters are facing. Uh, in the case of importers, and these are mostly importers for raw, raw materials, uh, 
the main issue seems to be regarding the advance payment requirement uh, issued by the government. Uh, there have been several changes in the requirement. Uh, at one point, there was a limit of 10,000. At some point, there was no advance payment allowed. And at some point, for certain sectors, up to 20% of the price was allowed as import, uh, as advance payment. But overall, the general sentiment of these importers is that it is not sufficient and it's kind of hindering the uh, way of doing business. So, but it's not all uh, bad news. So basically we also ask the companies about their perception on the changes, the improvement that has been taking place in uh, Pakistan. And you see, they have reported some good uh, business environment changes. For example, in the last five years, they, over 70, 80% of the problem uh, of the exporters say there's been improvement in electronic and computerized procedures, especially at the customs. Uh, and this goes hand in hand with the modernization plan, which the customs is implementing. There's been better electric uh, supply and there's been better security in the last five years. One of the issues uh, that has not gone well is related to air transportation. So they say the availability of a good quality or let's, let's say uh, limited or expensive airline transportation has uh, gotten worse. Uh, finally, one of the last aspect which we also look at is about uh, gender because it's quite important for ITC and also for World Bank about uh, gender equality. Uh, we see that women employment in Pakistan is very low. Only 4% of the employees are women in the trading companies. And also when it comes to entrepreneurship, uh, leadership in businesses, less than 10% of the companies are either managed or owned by women. And we wanted to see in general, how differently do women entrepreneurs uh, view NTMs compared to men? So when it comes to the types of NTM, uh, women face, it's not very different compared to men-led companies versus women-led companies. But what we do see is that the women-led companies are faced, uh, many more women-led companies are facing difficulties than men-led companies. So around 51% of the companies that are led by men are facing difficulties. In contrast, 66% of the women-led companies are facing difficulties with N uh, NTMs. Uh, also, we see that in general, women are facing uh, problems not only regarding export process, but there are also many women who are facing uh, difficulties becoming an, a su successful exporters or starting their own businesses. So uh, I will not have time to do this all. Uh, I think I've already consumed my quota time. So maybe I'll stop here for now and maybe we can discuss this later. I apologize for the lengthy presentation, sorry. I think you are mute, Dr. Nadim. Sorry, no problem in, in going uh, um, over time. Uh, Dr. Shinsta, you made a good presentation. Very good thoughts, very good ideas. We appreciate that. But let me just turn to um, Dr. Manzoor and ask him. Um, Dr. Sab, all these problems that Dr. Sharish uh, talked about, are these government failures or market failures? I still don't understand. For example, should we have a PCSI lab? Is it not possible for the private sector to do testing? Is it not possible for the boxes to be not examined before they are sent out? Should the customs people open every box and muck it up? Um, I don't know. I mean, what is the normal practice? Do other countries have this thing? happening like this, that the government is involved in exports all the way through and this huge kind of document, 45% of the problem is the government. I know there's a problem in EU and the US, but why are we creating additional hassles? Is it insoluble or does it relate to the same old problem that we always face that without a civil service reform, we can't tackle this problem as well? Dr. Manzoor. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we got a very good overview from uh, Shamit, and I would like to focus more on Pakistani side and because I've, I've worked in customs and I've worked in ports, so I'll uh, give my first hand experience. Dr. Nadeem's question, is it government's failure or not? I think it's very much a government's failure. Well, I give you two or three reasons. One, we have 
too many agencies. I don't think in any other country you have, uh, you know, a drug enforcement agency looking at every consignment. I mean, they have a percentage, they open everything. I mean, they used to be, uh, in Pakistan, they, they've been there for 40, 50 years, but they used to be a, a regulatory authority just passing on information. Now they have set up their offices at ports, at airports. You enter the airport here, first of all, there's a, a, a the, the drug people uh, looking at you, then it's a custom. So, so government has to reduce the number of agencies and have them at par. They should just see how many times um, a passenger or, or an export cargo is touched by our agencies, it's too many. It, it's first even customs, they don't uh, trust one uh, customs, they have several custom department, but one on top of it, it's, a, it's the NLC, it's the, you know, multiple port authorities, et cetera, they, they all check and, and that, that's a big problem. Second big problem is that uh, although we are working on this single window, but that might be another one or two years. Uh, and for the time being, it's all manual. I mean, if so, if an importer needs a certificate from our um, uh, testing, uh, whatever standards, uh, let's say, our, 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 our plant protection department, Okay, he is, uh, so a letter is sent to the uh, department and if importer takes it by hand, they say, we don't trust you. We'll have to confirm it from customs. Is it the original one? So that takes a lot of time. That's another government failure. Then government has some very strange uh, requirements. For example, uh, uh, Samid was referring to this halal certification. They just, uh, you know, they could say, okay, we want halal certification for meat, for some 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 edible products or something. Uh, I was in, in customs and there was a consignment of uh, dry milk. And uh, so the, the, the people said, that, you know, you need to, I didn't even know they sent a reference to Ministry of Commerce that uh, it doesn't have this halal certification. And in the meantime, the importer came to me and said, this milk is getting, uh, you know, at the port, it's getting spoiled. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I have all this documentation. So I said, okay, yeah, you know, let's release it provisionally. Uh, we'll, we'll wait for the certificate. And then I got an expression call from Ministry of Commerce. How could you release it without us authorizing whether it's halal or not? So, you know, this uh, strange uh, kind of... Uh, the, the, then another thing, recently, I think, last year, they put that every consignment should have printed in Urdu. What, what it is and you know how, so they, they don't make things only for Pakistan, you know, they, they make it for internationally. So, so there are a lot of these problems are, um, uh, uh, you know, Pakistan specific. That's why we are, we are our percentage is 55% compared to 20 for, for other countries and government can quite easily through cutting up this red tape can easily bring it down at least by half. Now, there were two or three other questions that was raised in that flyer. Well, one was that uh, is compliance with uh, these uh, sanitary and phytosanitary and technical barriers to trade, is it uh, advantages, is it additional cost or is it advantages for the, for the importers? I think this uh, uh, survey by ITC that indicated that they, con they consider it, uh, most companies consider it as an additional cost. But let me explain it. It's not really because they, they lose much more by not complying. I'll give you two examples. Now, the European Union, they kept warning us that uh, your fish that you export to EU is not, doesn't meet the sanitary conditions. And for years, uh, you know, they kept inspecting and warning. Finally, they put a ban on Pakistan in 2005 or six. And that ban stayed in place for seven years. And, and in 2013, they partially lifted it. And, uh, it, you know, the, and, and the, um, the losses were estimated anything between 20 to $40 million per year that, that we lost because of that. I, I can give you many more examples, but maybe one, one or two others just to explain the case. Now, um, we have this uh, free trade agreement with China 
and they uh, import, I think, about three billion worth of uh, meat. And our exporters are very keen to get access to that market because they, for, for the time being, how they are doing it is they send it to Vietnam and from there they reship it to China. But uh, they, they are unable to uh, do so from Pakistan because they don't meet the uh, sanitary conditions. And uh, they just need clean slaughterhouses. India was having a similar problems and they, you know, um, really improved some of their um, slaughterhouses. They invited the Chinese, they got satisfied. They said, and, and now I think India, I, I read in somewhere in their currency, they were spending something like 1400 crores to get rid of this uh, mouth and foot disease from the country so that they can, they can export their meat to any country in the world. So we need to take care of, of that. So um, to, I think, yeah, in terms of cost. Now we are very keen on exporting mangoes. And I think the EC, uh, various countries, they have some warning uh, and, and various uh, ports. If, if in, I don't know, it's five consignments. If they come across uh, the fruit fly, they put a ban on, on the country for that year's export. Sometimes we see in Pakistan, suddenly our, like, like last year, our, uh, our exports went up substantially, 100,000 tons. And that was because they put a ban on some countries in Africa. So, so Pakistan, and sometimes, you know, two, three years ago, it was in India and we gained. So, and, and, but many a times we lose a lot because our consignments, are, they, they, there's, there's no use sending them back. So they destroy them. So in, in, in short term, it looks like an additional cost, but actually in long term, it's, it's a lot of savings for the country and it's uh, uh, especially for, for these food products. Uh, if once you, if you send something, you know, at one time, China exported that uh, milk consignment and, the, and their, uh, their um, country's image was so badly damaged. So we, uh, I think we should, we have to be careful and spend, spend some money here so that we gain much more. Um, I think I, uh, I, I st yeah, well, one, one, one other point, I think maybe I'll, I'll come back if there's some other questions. We were working on having uh, a, a better coordinated, uh, better coordination, like, like the US, we were trying to establish a national animal and plant health inspection services. And we worked on it from, I think it was decided in 2012. And for seven, eight years, we are working and getting a lot of technical assistance, all the legal level, everything. And, and last I checked, they said, uh, well, it's been shelved. I mean, you know, I, I don't know, but we need a coordinating agency and, 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 and we don't have it. Uh, maybe I stop here and wait for other questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Dr. Adil Nakhoda, I still, have a problem with oh, what Dr. Mandu said. I don't agree. Is it a government problem or is it a market failure? Why can't private labs be set up to test those things? And I would also like to point out, Dr. Manzoor, you might remember an old friend of ours, Dr. Mr. Khalid Hassan, very famous writer, very well known yeah. personality. Yeah. He wrote a famous article which turned into a book. Title of the article was, and the book was, Give Us Back Our Onions. Because the best onions were being exported and we were being left with the worst onions. So I think I'm going to write uh, an article called Give Us Back Our Mangoes. Why do you want to export our mangoes? And I would insist that a mango exporting country will forever remain a banana republic. Don't we want better exports? The question, Dr. Adil Lakhoda, is, that when we've got a government, as I keep saying, that is Lord Macaulay's government, a 19th century colonial government that requires duplic documents in sextuplet and in quintuplet and in whatever, why can, how do you think, can we have exporters living outside the country? Is this not a part of the civil service reform that we've been harping about for the last 40, 50 years? And the World Bank says, no, that we can bypass it. Can we bypass it, Dr. Adil Nakhoda? Please, two questions. Market failure versus government failure, and is civil service reform central to this? Dr. Sab, I'll come back to you on this too. 
Sure. Uh, okay, thank you, Dr. Nadeem. Yeah, so first let me uh, give some insight on this, uh, some of the points that I have, then I'll come back to your question and I'll answer it in the meanwhile. So uh, so let me congratulate the authors for providing us right, with an excellent uh, report and an informative pres presentation. <clears throat> So I'd like to thank Pied and Gonzalo for the invitation. Uh, so this report by ITC is very comprehensive and uh, the, it details uh, the challenges faced by exporters and importers, right? So we have that here. Now, before I begin, so first let's just stress on the definition of what NTMs are. So the official policy measures that are in concept neutral and do not have a specific direction of impact. That's important to note here. The economic impact of NTMs tends to be less straightforward than tariffs as NTMs can be either beneficial or costly to the exporters. So depending on how, as Dr. Nadeem has stated, uh, the market failures, et cetera, that are there, so how the exporters can adjust to that, and then depending on that, whether it's costly or beneficial. <clears throat> now, NTMs have gained preference over tariffs as a policy tool, so we don't really have much of a choice that we have to uh, consider them as very important. So NTMs, for the purpose of this report, are referred to as burdensome. Now, this is important again. This report has taken the view that, uh, well, because it has surveyed firms and has asked them questions about how burdensome it is, so it may not have really picked up on the beneficial side of the, uh, uh, of the <clears throat> NTMs that uh, we often raise as well. So here it is important to stress that uh, technical regulations and conformity assessments are not primarily protective in nature, but rather they are set as policy objective in order to address health and safety concerns. Right? So this is what we are talking about uh, when we come to this market failures, et cetera. So certain te uh, technical NTMs are imposed to address market failures, remove negative externalities, and bolster consumer confidence on for foreign products, as otherwise consumers would have little or no information on whether the products are safe to consume. However, for smaller firms, even the cost of gathering information on NTMs can be prohibitively costly. And that's why you need the government's role to be much stronger in providing them the required information, how to tackle the, uh, the NTMs. So uh, ITC does do a good job in providing us with this information that we uh, need here. So the report clearly identifies the challenges businesses face when they participate in international trading activities via survey of Pakistani traders. So they face a hard time complying with trade regulations. These are more overwhelming for the firms in the agricultural sector than therefore in the manufacturing sector. Again, uh, technical measures seem to be a major challenge, particularly those that are required testing and product uh, certification. Again, so the example is quite straightforward here. We have a, a GSP plus uh, agreement with the EU, the concessions that we receive that reduce tariffs to zero in a lot of products, but still we face barriers due to NDMs. A lot of exporters are unable to export to Europe, uh, to the European Union, even though they've received zero concessions. So there is a lot more to the story than tariff concessions. And that is what NTMs are usually creating those barriers. So again, administrative costs tend to be a lot of a uh, big challenge as, um, uh, as shown in the report. And then adaptation costs then, so there's this whole concept of adaptation costs and that is what uh, firms need to adapt to these uh, measures so that they address these uh, market failures. So non-tariff barriers that involve procedural ob obstacles tend to be more intense from the firms than the measures themselves. Again, so this is an important point about this administrative cost. I actually feel that a lot of this uh, that uh, Dr. Nadim has always raised about the issues that he faces when he even applies for like uh, for a bank account, right? So those even are in the export industry. Firms face those kind of constraints and that hurts them, right? So therefore NTMs are costly not only because the costs to adapt uh, the measures are pretty high, but so are the administrative costs associated with them. Now, let me give you an example of pharmaceutical companies, right, who are willing to export. So they require drug and manufacturing license and a quality assurance certificate, apart from the more common documents before shipping the exportable uh, good. So this process itself can take up to 45 days, and for a lot of firms, it has taken up to 45 days to get the, that certificate, the license. And it can cost up to 50,000 rupees to get that license, which is a big amount, especially if you're going to regularly. But apart from that, they also need a no objection certificate that creates unnecessary hurdles, right? So the export license itself should suffice for the exporters. Reapplying for an NOC is not only costly, but can lead to uncertainty with exporting. Again, it creates unnecessary delays and payments add uh, to the administrative costs. So there is this whole uh, thing about uh, 
this uncertainty, the time delays, et cetera, that show up. And again, because of a lack of an uh, electronic single window, this whole process is worsened and delayed further. Now, NTMs, they do create opportunities as well. So if you address the market failures, it can be an opportunity for firms, right? So for firms that are adopting the best practices and standards, such as so a lot of MNCs that set up the don't participate in the global value chains, they can create opportunities not only for themselves, but also for the other firms that are involved in that global value chain, the supply chain, or the through poor competitive effort, uh, effects they have on smaller firms. So again, firms will learn from other uh, better performing firms and gain advantage. And then there's this whole thing about some large firms who are able to take advantage of quotas and licenses much better because they have the market power as well as they have the uh, bureaucratic clout, right? Especially the MNCs in the trading partners. So that can help them uh, a lot. So again, when we raise this question about, uh, mar uh, about market failures, so NTMs, they play a big role in reducing that. So they are raising consumer awareness, right? But it comes with a steep cost, adaptation costs that can be very costly for smaller firms. So uh, exporters are likely to adapt to technical features in a product that could help reduce neg negative externalities. And uh, uh, so this is what's happening here, right? So we have certain, again, but in Pakistan, we also, as uh, Samit has uh, uh, shown in his um, presentation, that there are minimum export prices that are imposed on the exports of medical uh, and surgical equipment. That makes them uncompetitive as well. So we have these other barriers that are imposed in certain industries that otherwise could be very competitive in the world market. So NTMs, the burden can be ravaging for the exporters, right? So we have that here. One second. So, yeah, so products are uh, likely to constitute a small percentage of the import basket in the destination markets. Now, this could suggest that the burden of compliance has shifted onto Pakistani exporters. So the whole problem here is that what Pakistani exporters may end up doing is that we have a large share uh, of our own exports in limited in textiles and agricultural products. As uh, Dr. Nadim just uh, said, asked his question, that we export mangoes. But the problem is that Yes, we do export mangoes, but we also concentrate a lot on our exports of these agricultural products. But what the other side is, when we are selling it to like the EU or to the US, they have a very small share in the market. So they may impose NTMs, but because there's a lot of consumers which may not be that, uh, uh, which may not be that important for them. So they may not be that stringent. They may not even try to, uh, so they may be creating more barriers than what, what is there, right? So that could be the other side. But then there's this other thing that, uh, if we are exporting a product that is common in our exports, such as mangoes, uh, the government can step in and help those exporters out. So there's this whole government role that in increases as well. So small exporters face significant costs that deter their participation, but larger firms end up benefiting with the economies of scale, et cetera, right? So we have that. So uh, the high, uh, some of the failures that were highlighted. Now, I'd like to raise some of my own questions in this thing. So. One thing that I want to ask was if compliance to NTMs are undertaken closer to pre-planning stages of production, can the cost of compliance be turned into an investment as it becomes embedded in the production strategy? So one thing was that uh, in the report, there's a mention that NTMs are a cost rather than an investment. So how do firms tackle that concept and address market failures with that, right? So are, we, are the firms addressing the failures too late, right, in the production strategy that it becomes an administrative cost rather than uh, the burden increases at the administrative side rather than in the production. So they can tackle this earlier on. They can make sure that they have the right inputs or the right strategies, production strategies involved so that they are tackling it before rather than after they have pro produced for the export market and realize that the products mm -hmm. have failed uh, to gain market share. So overall, I believe that the findings of the report are very relevant and as per expectations, the average cost of NTMs are likely to be higher for countries with poor infrastructure. This is exacerbated by the low value added nature of the products exported by low income countries. Again, it is imperative that Pakistan invests not only in electronic national single window system at the earliest, but also introduces a national trade portal that contains all relevant information on the trade processes, measures and practices. And the trade portal should have contained the maximum amount of information so that exporters don't need to go to different sources for their information. 
Now, this is being implemented by ITC in Africa and Central Asian countries. They have done a very good job by setting up for countries like the poorest countries, like Rwanda, uh, Uganda. They all have that. Zimbabwe has one. Uh, Tajikistan has a very excellent trade portal, which gives a lot of information up to the uh, even the officers involved in the process, right? Uh, they name them. So you actually know the exact time as well as the officers that are involved. So you can actually go to that officer and tell them why is my paperwork being delayed, right? So they have that info, that much information in that. So again, this quality of trade related infrastructure needs to be set up and improved in significant ways and that will reduce the administrative costs. So one thing that uh, comes up is that there are these implications of SPS agreement and TBT agreement on Pakistan's trade that will go a long way in reducing these market failures by providing the right information to the uh, to the exporters. So how well are the WTO and SPC TBT national inquiry points utilized? Again, this comes into the training of the civil services. Naturally, you need that. They need to be able to uh, utilize the, the resources that they have. So there's the inquiry point, but apparently it is not updated as often. So plans to ensure more accurate information is made available on them. The report does specify arbitrary behavior of the custom officials in both destination and origin ports, but arbitrary regulations imposed by countries without scientific justifications can also be damaged. So how do governments, how do agreements come in this role, the government role in this, right? Setting the right agreements in this SPS and TBT measures, as well as other NTMs, right? So the discriminatory behavior between trading partners is reduced. And then the question is, exporters, have they been able to tackle the situation where they believe that discrimination or they face challenges due to vague regulation? So again, the whole idea here is how the government responds to these accusations that these uh, exporters may ha have for uh, on based on regulations, right? So lack of knowledge on scientific justifications as well as geographical identification issues can hurt exporters. So one thing we talked about, and as was mentioned by Samit, was the uh, Basmati rice issue that has recently propped up. So are trade associations fully aware of the NTMs? And how are they playing a role to promote trade facilitation? Lastly, during the COVID-19 pandemic, what we saw was a lack of international regulatory cooperation and a lack of mutual recognition of measures right around the world. So China had different sort of export bans, export restrictions, and that has affected in a many way uh, the trade of global uh, medical supplies, right? So countries put their own restrictions, but because we saw that there's actually a lack of mutual recognition of uh, res res restrictions, et cetera, right? So government cooperation is very important in that. And how has that, and how do you think that will evolve once this pandemic is over? Here I'll conclude. And I think I'll I have raised uh, additional questions. So uh, here, the, I'll come back to these questions later on as we progress in the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Nadeem and uh, Gonzalo. Gonzalo. Thank you very much, Adil sir. Thank you very much. Um, I am still a little bit confused. Um, so I think it's a very good point to bring in Fayaz Makhans. Fayaz Saab, um, everybody points to the fact that customs is bothering people on the way out. And I just noticed it. I came from Pakistan to the US and I had to form a line for customs and I had to form a line for drugs until I lost my temper and I said, look, you guys, this is the time of COVID and you're making us line up and expose ourselves. And after a bit of a Squabble, I got through, um, I guess age helps. But the problem is why the hell are you bothering people on the way out? Why are containers being examined? Why are people being examined at airport? I mean, Jesus, do you need to check all of us again and again and again, 20 times over? I've been checked by a hundred thousand or million times by now. All my data is lying in the, in the, in the, in the, on, on your web. You can easily tell whether I'm a smuggler or not. I mean, don't you use prior information? Does everybody have to be checked all the time, 24 hours a day? Hey, Kansal. Uh, hey, Kansal there? Do you make Kansal hang any? Or have we lost make Kansal? I don't think Mekan Sam is here. Uh, Nabil, check Karle, Mansur Sab? Okay, fair enough. I don't think so. he's not around, sir. We are, uh, we are trying to catch him, but contact anyone. Not, not here. Okay, fine. fine. 
we'll proceed with it. So, Mandur sir, please tell me, you, mashallah, have been associated with this enterprise. Why do we have such a... I mean, I still don't buy Mandur sir, this is a government failure. I mean, why... Well, there is one government failure, the intrusive culture of uh, documentation, which my, myself have faced recently, where this has been... Now, uh, Gonzalo, listen, this has been six weeks since I applied for a credit card in Pakistan, and deliberately, just to test it out. The bank CEO told me, why don't you just take it? I said, no, I want to go through the normal, ch normal channels. I could have got it if I talked to the CEO. Six weeks. And I have all my records are with Nadra. I mean, I don't think there's anything hidden about me. I can't be. I'm a salary taker, for God's sake. What have I got that's hidden? Everything is with Nadra. And it's taking me six weeks, and I still haven't got it. This is the extent of non-tariff barrier or whatever, whatever you call it, non-price measure or administrative measures that we have in this country. And Dr. Mandur, sir, please tell me. Fair enough, this is uh, not related to exports, but this is normal in our culture. And we accept it. We accept it. We don't even, we don't even rebel against it. So it applies to exports too. So that's why I come back to my question. Do we need a deeper reform or is it just taking one thing at a time and trying, okay, we'll get rid of it because we'll never get rid of it. They'll put in more measures. Dr. Sab, unmute. Dr. Sab, unmute. <coughs> okay. Um, it's, it's a government failure, but it's, it's others failure as well, but mostly government failure. Now, for the, the case that you are mentioning, now, if you are going by, say, Emirates, or maybe you're going to US, you can already book your seat 24 hours in advance and they would not let uh, um, you know the PIA do that I mean in, in some countries you could already go and and drop your luggage somewhere and next day you can just walk in and, and go but they would not allow it here so it's it's it's, it's, it's it's the, it's the regulations which are creating all all these problems most of these problems but I think there's a need for someone to look at these things. And, you know, for example, I, I asked many of our um, ministers, they still uh, health ministers, why do you still insist that, uh, you know, you have, they, they give a little form saying, have you been to Africa in the last, as Latin America in the last six months? And they say, if something was introduced about 40 years ago, so it should either be updated or it should be discontinued. People have problem filling this form. And even if they fail, nobody cares. They just throw it there. So, the, the, you know, the, somebody has to, you, you don't like donors, but somebody has to inspect how many times we are checked. And, and I think that that is, you know, the, and, and then there is, I think in um, uh, our um, airports or our ports, there should be one overall regulator, whoever it is, they, we should decide. Now, everybody is uh, operating independently. That that creates another problem. Um, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but but there were a couple of other questions that I see on the side people were raising. If, if you allow me, I could go, <coughs> go to them. <coughs> Somebody asked, is it, uh, what's the, how much is it cost for tariffs and non-tariff measures? I can, I can give a general guess. I, I, I know Ong Tad had done some study, but I don't have it right hand, uh, away with me. But the generally tariffs have come down very, very substantially. Uh, general averages, in, maybe in case of Pakistan, it's very high, but other countries it's two to 3%. It's the non-tariff barriers, non-tariff measures, which are many, many times more. You know, it's, uh, at, at, I don't uh, exactly know the figure uh, at present, so I wouldn't like to, to guess it, but it, it's many times more for non-tariff, they say. Second, somebody asked, uh, I think uh, there was, um, uh, well, is our Department of Plant Protection effective? Yes, it is effective, but it, it, it would have been much, much, in, in, partially effective, but it would have been much, much better to update it with the modern legislation, put all these, uh, whether it's plant protection or animal health and all this, all together as one authority as other countries have it. And unfortunately, we, we don't have that. It, it could be done much better. And, and the other thing is that, uh, you know, sometimes, for example, um, uh, even Lahore, I saw at one time, there was a big problem because this plant protection 
there, there was no rep at, at, at Waga, so they had to send it to the city. The person would come and then do it. So the, these kinds of problems. Then I think somebody else asked, uh, you know, what is the, um, uh, you know, how many SPS and how many um, uh, technical barriers trade? And there was a, I, I, I saw a paper from PIDE. It was published uh, three, four years ago. And they said between, they looked at three of our partner countries. One was uh, US, UAE, and um, one other country, three countries. And they said, well, Pakistan was, uh, Pakistani exporters was subjected to 3,300 uh, mayors for, for standard, so they had to comply with them. Either the, the consignment was destroyed or, or they had to redo something, or, uh, whatever uh, they had to re they got it re exported or something. And in case of technical barriers, there was something like 2,700 cases. I think I stop here. Thank you. Um, uh, Gonzalo, can you uh, quickly come in and tell us some of these non tariff measures, especially at the um, at the end of the receiving countries, let's say EU or US or whatever, are these a matter of negotiation? Are these the same for every country? I mean, for example, uh, has Bangladesh negotiated better than us or India negotiated better than us? Are there more restrictions than us or are, there, um, are they uniform across for everybody? Well, in principle, these measures should be uniform across everyone. So say, for example, when the European Union says uh, to, to buy beef from anyone, I need a full traceability system in the exporting country. This applies to everyone, and there is no space for negotiations there, right? Uh, so it is there uh, where, where, where I wanted to, to get into the point that you were making. Is this, so is this a problem of market failure or a government failure? Can the private sector do it? And I think it's important to distinguish between certain measures and certain Everything goes in non-tariff measure. As you, as you were saying, your NADRA problem, is that a non-tariff measure, a non-tariff barrier or not? Well, the, there, is a, there is a definition, and Samid went into the definition of what, what is understood as a non-tariff measure and what not. But there are certain non-tariff measures that require government intervention because they pose a coordination failure. So say, for example, this issue with the beef and the traceability, right? So, it's, it's, it's going to be extremely difficult for any producer in Pakistan to sort out the full traceability system uh, to be able to sell to, to the European uh, Union, uh, to sell beef to the European Union. This re will require a concerted effort in which the government will need to step in. It happens often also when it comes to certification of compliance uh, with certain standards in which you need a lab, that it may be the case that if there is no critical mass of demand in the country, then private labs will not come in, right? And there won't be a critical mass if there are no private labs because they can certify. So you have this chicken and egg problem. We can call it a coordination problem. And so it makes sense for the government to step in perhaps and say, well, let's set up a, a lab or let's help firms get certified somewhere else. So if we don't want to set up a lab, we help firms uh, get certified is somewhere else. So they, they, there, are, there are some cases in which uh, it is warranted that you have uh, public sector intervention. Now, there are other cases, and, and, and I, I, Dr. Mansour published an article uh, very shortly after, uh, after the ITC released this report on, on NTMs uh, on, on this export uh, inspection issue. And on the export inspection issue, uh, it is clear that a movement to a risk-based system in which you don't inspect manually all containers, but instead go to a, to a risk-based system is, uh, is the way to go. So it's unfortunate that uh, Chief Customs didn't join uh, this webinar because it would be good to understand how the progress is, uh, is in that area. But I, I will stop here, but the, the short answer is these measures are uh, are uh, applied to everyone, right? So they are not discriminatory in principle. Oh. This is where I come back to you, Dr. Uh, Samir. Can, can I just add uh, something okay. to uh, Gonzalez's point? Go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, well, uh, this is with reference to your question, is it a uniform? And I agree with what he said, but there is one additional thing. 
that many countries, especially in their uh, trade agreements or their customs unions or whatever, it's, it's a free trade area, they have this mutual recognition agreements or what they call MRA. So you do a test here, it's accepted in that laboratory. And Pakistan has very few of that. So, so that means that even if we certify something, the other country doesn't agree and they have to do it again and again. And that adds to the cost. Okay. But is that not, Dr. Mazur, is that not what we do free trade agreements for? We yeah, have we, we do, free trade yes. do they not have? Yes, yes no. but, but we, we don't have any. We hardly have any. We just have one with China and China, uh, this was, uh, you know, uh, first, first generation. We didn't include these things. That's only about tariffs. I mean, so we don't have any. Okay. So, but is that our failure or is that the failure of, uh, I mean, we not negotiate the non-tariff barriers there? It's our failure, but we, you know, we are very allergic to these uh, free trade agreements. We, uh, you know, this morning I, I published an article and, uh, about not having uh, FTA and somebody wrote back to me and said, look, I mean, we kept uh, negotiating with Thailand for years and years, with Turkey for years and years, Singapore, and they came several times and finally all of them said, okay, hands off, we don't want to negotiate with you. Just, just let's stay the way we are. So that's our problem. Because it, every time we try to negotiate a free trade agreement, it, it, some industry feels that their interest might get hurt. So everybody wants uh, uh, opt out. And that means it's, it's kind of like, it's like we have with uh, Malaysia, et cetera. There's no, they're not called free trade agreements. They're just, okay, we'll give you some concession on, on, on your uh, edible oil that you send, palm oil, and you give us some on rice. That, that's not called free trade agreement covers substantial trade, more than 90% of trade. We don't have that. Okay. So once again, once again, we fail because we are unable to envisage a thing properly. Dr. Samit, before I go to the floor, I just want to raise one question with you and then I'll start taking questions from the floor. So please raise your hands. Dr. Samit, tell me um, how much will this help? For example, the question that I have in mind that if we have a domestic market that's vibrant and if we have domestic brand names, they will get past this issue on their own without much government intervention. The case I have in mind is McDonald's, for example. McDonald's does come to Pakistan, India, Africa, everywhere. And McDonald's is able to get past all these restrictions. They're able to trace the beef. They're able to trace the potatoes. They're able to do everything. Is that something that we, is that, does that have a lesson for us or it, it does not? Thank you for the question. So <clears throat> I'm just wondering, like over here, when you talk about the McDonald's case, are you talking about McDonald's, which is present in Pakistan itself? So in that case, like, you know, we are not really talking about exports because this is going to be consumed domestically. So basically, NTM doesn't apply in this case. Uh, but before you move on to the floor, I just wanted to add what Dr. Manjul added. Uh, sorry? sorry. My point was that McDonald's is able to give the same quality everywhere and get over all the problems because it has a brand name, it has a multinational muscle. So if we had the similar kind of company, let's say we have some Tikka Kebab company that is on the same level as McDonald's, same level of branding, would it be able to get past these restrictions easier than these small companies that are unable to organize themselves? Uh, I have my doubts about this thing because uh, as... I again mentioned like these are not really export related cases, but also when you come to like very big exporters, like even for, if you a uh, McDonald's in Europe is wanting, wants to source from Pakistan, they still have to comply with the European regulation. So there are two things. One of the thing is NTMs, which is mandatory government regulations. And beyond that, they are also buyer regulation, which we call voluntary sustainability standards. So buyer requirements. So these are not mandatory, but without meeting those standards, they, uh, exporters probably cannot find a buyer. So to summarize, uh, I don't think just because it's a big buyer doesn't necessarily mean that uh, sellers from Pakistan would be export uh, be able to export easily. Okay, fair enough. But another question, sorry, then I'll go to the floor. Uh, the 45% that you say is on our side, our problem. Can the government not just simply say, okay, we're going to drop all those 45% restrictions today? Is it possible? Or is, is there some international treaties that stop them from saying, okay, sorry, we're not going to check anymore? So uh, this is interesting because, yeah, 45%, it's, as I said, this is quite a lot of issues. 
And I think there are quite a lot of things the government itself can do to reduce some of these problems. As we always say, market access begins at home. So 45% of the hindrance at home is quite a lot of numbers. So basically, if the government actually want to enhance uh, the export, there are certain things that they can do. For example, if an uh, exporter is uh, importing, they can uh, maybe try to do something about the advanced payment requirement. So this is a hindrance for a lot of producers who have to rely on raw imports of materials and then processes and export. So without importing, they cannot process. So the export is being restricted. Another issue is about duty drawback, which we see a lot of those things. Uh, in general, the problem is not regarding regulation, but the way it is implemented. So that's the main issue. Uh, they're saying they're waiting for years and years, and they don't understand what is actually holding it up. And I think I read a news uh, very recently that there has been a new fully automated drawback system being implemented in Pakistan, which is intended to address this issue about NTMs, like, you know, automated duty drawback scheme. So I saw this news uh, this week. So maybe it can some way address this kind of issues. But overall, uh, as I said earlier, there's a lot the government can do. For example, uh, enhancing the export quality managed infrastructure in the country. That's also one of our key recommendation. Uh, there has been shortage of funds in this laboratory. The laboratories, they do want to provide the services, but they do not have enough resources to provide this thing in an efficient manner. So helping in terms of infrastructure upgrade, having qualified uh, manpower in these laboratories can really help uh, customers, I mean, the exporters overcome this cost. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, I'll go to the floor now. Can I add, add something here? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So one thing I think we have left out, so there's this issue of regulatory distance, right? So it comes up with Gonzalo's point and everything. So what is happening here is that if we do not have NTNs for our own imports, that if we don't have harmonized them, uh, so a lot of African countries have started harmonizing their uh, NTMs, their own restrictions based on what the Europeans are doing, because they want to get into the European value chains. Right? So you may see that the Asian countries, uh, the East, Southeast Asian countries, especially Vietnam, et cetera, they want to enter the value chains of the European countries or the America or the US or even China itself. So they may start uh, incorporating, uh, reducing this regulatory distance where they may start uh, merging their regulations to the similar extent as uh, Europe so that they can participate that the quality that they may require for their own inputs may be the same as the ones that are for the European, for the ones that we are selling to Europe. So if this happens, this may lock countries out that are not participating in those, uh, that are not harmonizing in that sense. So it may lock us out from the global value chains themselves. One thing that people talk about is China on leather, uh, imports of leather rawhide. I've heard that they are putting restrictions on the imports of rawhide from Pakistan because the shoes they sell to Europe have certain requirements. And if the Pakistanis don't maintain that requirement in their own, the way they get the rawhides, et cetera, obtain the rawhides, it may affect their own uh, trade with Europe, right? Because there's a sort of uh, origin where they have to declare where their hide is coming from, et cetera. So these things can have a big impact in that way. So that's why NTMs are very critical. We need to stop thinking about, uh, we need to start reducing tariffs for sure, but we also need to start thinking about NTMs. We need to participate in the value chains. And these value chains will become ever more important, I think, with this whole now debate that will happen with the pandemic, uh, because there's been a lot of, uh, arbitrary changes in policies and export restrictions, et cetera. And that will naturally bring a new debate once this pandemic is over, how to naturally address those concerns. So this is becoming very important in that sense, this whole discussion on NTMs. Okay. That's why I like okay. this topic, Thank personally. You. Okay, yes. let's go to the floor. Let's take some questions. Nure Hera. Nure Hera, can you please speak? <clears throat> Go ahead. Introduce yourself. Introduce yourself. Say what you want. Hello, sir. Hear me? Go ahead. Uh, sir, the uh, report is very informative. I just want to ask uh, the small exporter. The small exporter want to know about the uh, specific product related standards. From where he can uh, get information, document related to specific product like uh, in the presentation he showed 60% agriculture products are affected from SPS mail not following from standards. 
so there he can uh, get documents so he can do initial examination of his product before official examination and this would be a time saving my question is from mazoor ever thank you sir fair enough we'll come back to the question we'll come back to doc saab just hold on to the questions um, Sh shafiq shahzad saab please uh, i'm shafiq shahzadi a uh, commercial officer london uh, uh, mine is more of a comment uh, than a question uh, dr manzoor saab uh, very rightly pointed out that mras are the answer in today's world to address these sp issues but a uh, certain case of pakistan i would just like to clarify that for a country to enter into an mra you have to have those kinds of standards and especially the labs put in place in your country in order to mm -hmm. enable them to you know qualify for the standards in the other country so now how come malaysia would degree to pakistani standards if we do not have the labs of those qualities likewise in case of china we have this chapter of mras with indonesia though it's a, a not a complete free trade agreement and some of the provisions are there in the free trade agreement with china but the point is they do not agree to the certification so first we have our labs will have to get certifications and after that we'll be able to get into mras with some countries so that's a typical challenge for which we need to invest in upgradation of our labs and that to get them accredited the other thing uh, uh, adil saab you were saying that uh, standards harmonization yes that we can do in case of most of the you know uh, engineering and electronic goods but in case of food these are country specific standards so you cannot you know have the same standards in each country every country has to have its own country specific standards so that's that's uh, just my observation thank you ye yeah, mra kya hota hai shafi shafiq saab ye bata de uh, sir mra is a mutual recognition agreement main agar aasan zuban mein samjhaun sir to uska matlab ye hai agar main angrezi mein rakhe because i am foreigner sir all right sir right <coughs> uh, so uh, a mutual recognition agreement is basically Uh, when your country's lab certifies to some particular product the other country will agree to that certificate that you have issued and will not ask for the importer to get any certificate from any particular lab so any exporting country certificate would be as good as an importer's country certificate so that means the importer country will agree to your standards and certification so that that's that's my comment on that my question to you then you mashallah sure. you mashallah trade official ki how difficult is that to do for example chuptai lab aga khan lab etc that i see they do our blood tests to international standards do ultrasounds to international standards so the, our labs are there now the sure. question is our universities have labs and there's lots of labs around that we know private sector can set up a lab for example here in the us everything is done in a private sector lab there are government labs don't do these private sector tests so how difficult is that to do i mean is it something that that's not happening because of bureaucratic requirements or hurdles if the market wants it why can't it be done after all the market wants blood tests right so chuktai lab is now a multi billion dollar enterprise i mean so is aga khan multi billion dollar enterprise and i know people who are investing in these labs so why is that not happening is that a bureaucratic hurdle i think it is uh so <clears throat> i would slightly uh, back to differ on that yes yeah. in case of human case we have good quality labs but in case of the food products uh, anybody who is familiar any lab in pakistan which would certify that this food is you know uh, compliant with you know fish standards in europe probably nobody would know that we have just few labs pcsir and some government agencies i agree partly what you said sir that ministry of science and technology is responsible to maintain such you know labs which are capable and accredited with inter international labs but um, i think the requisite infrastructure the unido has launched a massive plan in pakistan they invested in upgradation of labs in pakistan for industrial standards and for the food products but these labs are not self sustainable sir that that's an issue probably we create huge infrastructure and they are unable to generate required funds for that so they need a sustainable funding from the government which i think government is not able to so until unless we create that mechanism whereby these labs become self sustaining this system will not work sir okay 
Okay, great. So let's give the panel, please remember this. We'll come back to it at the end. Khurram Saab, Mohammed Khurram. Okay. Um, hello. Um, I'm um, Khurram. Okay. Um, I, I would like to uh, like ask a question regarding the information costs. Like um, it's really um, information inform, information like it's really costly for these small um, like manufacturers exporters who want to access the uh, foreign markets and especially the procedural um, like the ways to to like um, to access the international markets. It's it's very information costly for all the procedures. So like is, is the uh, like government setup doing anything to um, like elevate these uh, information costs? Ali Kamal sir. Ali Kamal. Okay, uh, thank you very much, sir. So, um, basically, we are moving from uh, the local bureaucracy to international bureaucracy, and uh, that's that's the way I see this uh, bureaucracy hurdle. It's an international bureaucracy hurdle. Is that one fine day, uh, any country come up with some components and do and they start producing either in their own country or they find one fine market from where they are importing beef. Uh, or meat or any any kind of fruit and they put some res restrictions on the developing countries and that's what WTO is because one of my teachers says that WTO is basically for the developed countries not for the developing countries and every country has their own restrictions so this is a money-making business for me that they have all non-tariff measures uh, and they put all the certification and other cost on developing countries that they have to uh, certify your products and then you can export it to us otherwise you cannot so this is my take if anyone want to answer thank you great uh, dr harun javed Qureshi, you have put down a question here that i i think if you can ask it yourself would be good do you want to ask it or shall i read it out thumbs up dr dr harun javed Qureshi. So Dr. Sub is basically asking here, okay, I am exporting electronic goods. So I've got four cartons, each of them is worth $120,000, but they're four cartons, they're not a container. How is, am I going to be treated the same as a container full of bananas or mangoes, or is it going to be different? So with that, let me go back to the panel and let's see. So Samid Sub, Dr. Samid, would you like to go first and take on any or all the questions that have been asked? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nadeem. Uh, I would like to tackle the information, uh, the question about information sources. Like, you know, we have heard not only today, but also from our exporters like we interviewed. They do face a lot of issues regarding information. Information cost is quite high, especially if you are a new exporter, you don't know what to do, or you don't know uh, other exporters who can support you. This is kind of a big barrier. It's like, you know, if there's no word of mouth, uh, it's quite, quite difficult to get information sources. Uh, so this is also part of our recommendation like for the government of Pakistan to improve trade information sources. Obviously, we know there's a trade information portal, uh, but most of the information which has been put there is like uh, PDFs of, let's say, trade agreements, which is rather legal documents. It's not very business friendly, let me put it in that way. So the idea would be for this trade information sources to make this information more digestible for the exporters and importers so they can uh, do the step-by-step -step process guide and uh, get this information easily. In the meantime, there were questions like, where can you get this kind of information? Uh, for example, if you're exporting apples and you want to export it to, let's say France, where can you get this information? Uh, I would recommend like one of the sources which we have uh, in ITC, the market access map. So where you can enter your product, what you're exporting and where you are exporting to, and that will give you a list of requirements that you have to fulfill uh, 
to export to that particular country. So if you get in my presentation, there is a link to that website as well, my market access map. So that's one information. Uh, were there any other things that I needed to address? Uh, so basically the answers regarding the MRA, I think it has already answered pretty well by Mr. Shajat. Uh, um, yeah, I think that's it from my side. If there's anything else, please do let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Adil Saab, Dr. Adil Nakoda. Yeah, so I was looking at the question. So the documents available, yeah, again, so Summit has raised that point that a lot of documents that we have on the government websites that tend to be in PDF, very difficult to read, very difficult to understand, even for the experts. Uh, even for us who are working on data, it's very difficult to extract them and do any relevant work with them, right? So there's a big challenge with that. That So what the uh, answer to that is to have a good national trade portal, a repository, which gives you all the answers at one place. There is trade portals created by ITC themselves for uh, Tajikistan. So Tajikistan has an excellent trade portal. We can emulate that and we can have something very similar. Right, so the trade portals that we have right now, they're not very self-sustainable uh, in that sense that they don't answer sufficient um, in answering the questions. Uh, you have to look at other sources, you have to look at other links, you have to still, uh, so there can be a site which can exactly go step by step for every single process involved and every official, as I said, uh, previously involved can be there. So that is one way, then there is this restriction by foreign governments. So the whole thing that happened, someone asked about this whole thing that we're looking at foreign bureaucracy now instead of the local bureaucracy. But this, I think, will be part of trade. If you want to naturally, the whole concept of trade here is to satisfy. So remember this, every government has to protect its own people, right? So the whole idea of a good effective government is to make sure that you are not importing goods which are dangerous to the public health or safety. And this is what NTMs generally do is to make sure that what we are importing meet those certain standards and specifications so that we are not importing disease or we are not importing uh, uh, some issues with the crops or something like that, which is creating these problems for us. So every government has this right to protect its own people. I think that's what mostly it is. NTMs, the whole idea of NTMs, the technical ones. Then you have these other non-technical me measures and that's debatable. So that again comes up. So there is all this debate whether how effective they are, how there is all this thing. But again, as uh, uh, Gonzalo has said earlier, that some of the NTMs can be very beneficial to businesses across uh, across uh, across countries because by adapting and complying, you may end up actually in upgrading your product quality and selling to markets which otherwise you were not able to access. So that could be another thing in that. Uh, any other question that we have? If I just may add to what you were mentioning regarding yeah. cost and investment. So not only about cost of complying with non-tariff measures, but businesses, they might actually benefit if they also invest in other private standards, for example, organic certification, bio certification. It definitely is a cost involved, but if you are approaching good quality product and if you can able to prove and get this kind of certification, you might get a premium price in your market. So basically you're exporting the same product, but with the bio certificate, then maybe you, your premium can go like in 20, 30% up, like especially when it comes to market like in Europe. So basically uh, companies, they also need to not think of the certification only as a burden, as a cost, but rather also an opportunity and uh, as a way of investing in the business. Okay. Yeah, I had one thing yeah, thank you, sir. That's exactly what it is. So when we, when we look at food exporters who are selling in the local market, we see how the packaging is, how the packaging is very different than the local uh, producers who may be just selling on the street, right? They're charging a higher price, but they are uh, uh, making a list of different certifications that they have satisfied. They're making a list of a wide, wide variety of uh, well, NTMs that they are satisfying when they're selling European certifications. There are this food certifications of America uh, for the US market that they have and they're selling in the local market at a much higher price than their local competitors. But you will buy those products, why? Because you yourself believe in those certifications and say that if they can get those certifications, they pay money for that, they can sell you uh, and they can sell in the local market and they will be safe to consume. They won't be selling junk like uh, dangerous products, right? Which you may get from an unmarked product, unlabeled product in the local market which may be at a cheaper price, much cheaper price, but 
you would find them more dangerous to consume. So even us, even domestic consumers have become more uh, as, uh, acceptable of uh, these certificates and standards that we see on a local products. Okay, thanks. Right? Masood Ahmed Saab, commercial counselor Tehran is asking a question. Masood Saab, would you like to ask it yourself? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, actually, it's not a question, it's more of a comment uh, because sometimes uh, uh, the regulation of importer, importing and exporting countries are not the one that create NTMs. Like Iran's case uh, where due to US sanctions, Pakistani banks are shying away from uh, Iranian banks in establishing LCs. So Pakistani exporters are unable to exploit that uh, market to its fullest. So this is a sort of comment um, uh, because uh, uh, this is something extraneous uh, to both the trading countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mandur Saab, your last comments. Uh, all right. Hmm. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, first, uh, uh, Dr. Nadim, you, you uh, asked that question about McDonald's and, and uh, it was related to what uh, Arun Javed Qureshi, Dr. Qureshi was saying that he, he sends one box which is very expensive and why should You see, for these things in this new uh, WTO agreement, there's a provision for what they call authorized economic operators. So they declare, for example, if you're traveling very frequently, they have in the system, okay, don't check Dr. Nadim, we know him. Or, or, or say Dr. Uh, Arun Qureshi, they, uh, you know, the customs, they already, he would have applied to them. He said, look, I mean, I don't uh, do uh, drugs, etc. I've been exporting for so many years. Uh, this is my record. So you accept me as an authorized, so you don't check it. And many a times what happens is that you, uh, other country, you sign up with another country, you say, we'll accept your authorized uh, exporters and you accept ours. And that works very well, then it, things go very smoothly. That was one. Second question was uh, Ali Kamal, Dr. Ali Kamal, uh, you know, he was bashing WTO, but WTO has nothing to do with it. WTO, although people say your TBT agreement and SPS, the w, WTO says that these should be there should be some scientific basis for whatever you do. You just cannot one day say, oh, arsenic should be so much in rice, then we would not. Some countries do it, Australia does it, but then you can file a case against them in WTO that this country is not following any scientific exercise. They're just doing it arbitrarily. And, you know, you, uh, for example, Mexico had banned our rice for no reason saying that, oh, you used to have some kind of parasite in, in, in your rice. And then we said, okay, we are going to take them to WTO and they, and they, they, they opened up their market. So this, this and all the time, this, this keeps happening. Um, uh, the, the third question was, uh, yes, there was a lot of discussion about this uh, information portal. You know, they, uh, unfortunately, sometimes we do things that nobody knows, but in, in 2013, 14, 15, USA had a trade um, uh, project here in Pakistan. So they, they spent huge amounts. They developed a very uh, comprehensive trade portal. And then once they, once they done it, and it was done for um, Trade Development Authority, Partida, and they, they said, unless you give us money to keep managing it in future, we will not take it. So they didn't take it. So I, I don't know, they, they left it somewhere. So it's, it's there, it's all developed. It was all sorts of information, everything, but, they, but, but nothing happened. And then somebody asked about specific information, where do they get? And, and the ITC source was already explained. Uh, let me explain two other things that in most of the most developed countries and many, many developed countries they have a system what they call advanced ruling. So you can write to them and they normally write back to you within a week. Uh, you can ask, where do you classify this? How much is the duty? Is there any other restriction? And they, they respond to you. You can do it even as a trial. You can send to EC on, on something. That's, that's another source. The third source is that we have our commercial uh, attaches in about 50, 60 countries. And uh, some of them are quite uh, like, like uh, we had a uh, colleague from London, they're very conscientious, you know, they, they try to find whatever is there. So you, you should at least try them, write to them. This is what this country I want to export, what do you say? So there are these many, many sources uh, 
uh, available. Um, I think that's about it, unless there's any other question that, uh, yeah, I think that, that's it, uh, Nadim, from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Gonzalo, last word to you. Sum it up for me. I think I'll find it very hard to sum it up. So. Okay, sure. Thank you, Nadim. Thank you, Nadim. So it is actually, you will find it very hard to sum it up because it's very hard. It's a very hard topic, right? So it involves many things. Uh, Non-tariff measures can be many different things. Uh, I think the key challenge uh, becomes, we have a key challenge when non-tariff measures become non-tariff barriers. That is, when they are designed in a way to impede trade. And this is what uh, Dr. Mansour was mentioning before. Well, there needs to be scientific evidence uh, one, uh, before countries impose this type of, of measures. There are a number of, of, of elements that were discussed here that I, I, I found quite interesting, right? So there is one element that has to do with how do firms comply with standards or get their uh, standards certified uh, when they don't have access to the information they need to do that. And this is something that affects predominantly small and new exporters that may not know how to get the information or may find it very expensive to get that information. So Dr. Mansour again shed light on what are certain avenues to find this information. Trade portals can be a, a way of doing it, as, as Adil was mentioning, but they have this issue of uh, high maintenance costs. And if there is no maintenance of trade portals, they become completely useless, right? Because this information changes uh, permanently. Uh, and then there is a, a whole agenda to advance on this that has to do with uh, mutual recognition agreements. Uh, I, I can't help but thinking about the situation of Britain and the European Union right now, in which Britain is embarking in a very complex situation in which you will need to start negotiating agreements of mutual recognition in so many areas uh, that involve trade in goods and services. So Pakistan uh, could advance in that area, but in general, these agreements come attached to a new generation of free trade agreements that again, as Dr. Mansour mentioned, Pakistan doesn't have many of those. So the, in a way, this, this, this agenda of dealing with non-tariff measures and making them less, uh, less of, of, of bad barriers uh, for exporters have to do with a whole uh, agenda of, of, of stimulating trade and stimulating uh, exports uh, that, that will come with an agenda of uh, free trade agreements, mutual recognition agreements, uh, etc. And I would just say one thing uh, on the functioning of customs that is uh, extremely uh, important because a lot of these measures uh, actually end up being implemented in customs and the way that customs work. If they work efficiently or not efficiently, that makes a huge difference. So, with this, I will I will uh, I will stop, uh, and I will again express my gratitude to panelists, the keynote speaker, and uh, Pine for for organizing this great uh, exchange and all the participants. Thank you, Nadim. Before you go, I must ask you. Uh, this is something that uh, you know I advised the government twenty years ago, and we keep still talking about it. Um, I remember I raised this issue, and the Ministry of Commerce has reacted. Mazur Sahib knows Ministry of Commerce has tried to build it up too, but not. My point was very simple, and I wrote a paper on this too. That, uh, we seem to have a mercantilist approach in our policy, where we think that we can export and forget about the domestic market. Uh, this is exactly mercantilism that was practiced by Colbert, etc., and led to the uh, French Revolution. Can we separate exports from the domestic market or should we focus on the domestic market? For example, if we have, as I said, a good McDonald's at home, it could be an export commodity. If we have a good um, Al-Fatah, for example, is a store that's developing. If we have a good Al-Fatah, it's a process. It's a process that can be exported. Instead, we've got Carrefour here at a subsidy. We've imported Carrefour at a subsidy. So, uh, and similarly, I could go on. There are so many other products at home that we could allow to develop, provided they developed in the domestic market. Because um, one thing that I noticed that a McDonald's develops in Chicago. Once it succeeds in Chicago, then goes to Illinois. Once it succeeds in Illinois, then it goes to the rest of the US. And once it succeeds there, then it goes overseas. Unfortunately, we are trying to build an export market without a domestic market. I just want your opinion on this. Is this a feasible strategy or not? 
This is a great question, and I am sorry you posed it at the end of the seminar because I, I have a lot to say on this, right? Uh, I think it's a, I, I honestly feel that I'm not sure you're describing, and I'm being uh, uh, perhaps a, a, I'm daring to say thing, you know, you, you, you know much more about this country, of course, but I will still say it. Uh, I, I beg to defer on, on, this, uh, on this view that, you know, there is one phrase and sometimes, you know, phrases and the way people say things say a lot about the underlying thinking. Uh, in this country, they talk about export surplus, right? So they say, oh, there is no export surplus in Pakistan and this is why exports are low. This implies that you first focus on the domestic market and whatever remains, you export. This is a phrase I haven't heard in many other places, but in Pakistan, this story of the export surplus. Perhaps because I come with a, from a small country that is more export oriented, right? Uh, but, but I've been around, around the, 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 the block a little bit. So the, there is, I, I understand the argument that first, and it's very important, you experiment in the domestic market before you go abroad. And in general, the pecking order is domestic market, region, and world, right? Pakistan has a challenge in the region because it doesn't trade for a number of, 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 of geopolitical reasons with the main partner in the region. But the thing is that for, for to have that, that jump in which you say, okay, focus on the domestic market first, and then you will, you will start exporting. Then what you need is that there is not a huge difference between producing for the domestic market and producing for export markets. If there is a huge difference in terms of profits or in terms of uh, quality standards, then you won't make that change. And this is that, 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 uh, that step, you won't take that step. And this is what I feel that in this country uh, is, uh, that, that is a big problem. That is, on the one hand, and this comes back to the tariff structure problem, the tariff structure gives you so much protection to produce for the domestic market that it is difficult for firms to make that jump from the domestic market to exporting because they lose all of that protection. So that anti-export bias or the trade policy uh, framework. And then the other thing is a quality differential, right? And this comes to the NTM story. That is, if you produce your beef without any sort of traceability and people are willing to consume it in Pakistan, it's going to be very difficult for beef, uh, for meat packers to make that jump and say, okay, I will sell a little bit in the domestic market and a little bit in Europe because it's completely different production processes. So what I would say is that uh, the, for, for the domestic market to be a platform for exporting in the future, then what you will need is a different set of incentives so that uh, firms are not super encouraged to stay in the domestic market. And I will finish with this. Ultimately, the key point is the productivity at which you produce and the efficiency with which you do things. If you work very efficiently and supply your domestic market in a super efficient way, then growth will pursue, will come. But if, you, if your level of productivity is extremely low and the only way you sell domestically is because you're highly protected, then that is a challenge. So I think the key issue here is not domestic market versus, uh, versus exporting. I think the key issue is productivity, how to make firms more productive. And trade has a little bit to do with this and this is why, why we focus on it. But I'll, I'll stop here. I hope I sort of answered. Good, good, good. good answer. Anybody else wants to say anything or I close? Mandu Saab, do you want to say anything? Adil Saab, anybody? Sameer? Okay. Uh, Dr. Nadeem, can I? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, please, please. Okay, um, there was a question about Iran. I think that's, that's a common problem with other countries as well, but India has got around to it, you know, by this uh, currency swap arrangement or whatever, they don't, they don't deal in dollars and there are billions of trade there. You know, they buy in the Indian local currency here and they buy it there. So, so other countries have managed that, but I, you know, we have the least trade with Iran because of these sanctions, but uh, you know, all other countries have the similar blockage, but they find ways around it. And Pakistan has just stayed back. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Can I add just to what uh, Gonzalo just uh, said about, he actually raised a very important point, uh, the anti-export bias that we have in this country in a way that we're focusing on the domestic market. So I was with uh, HE, uh, I was advising for ATC on this export and entrepreneurship program that they wanted to start the courses. So they wanted to make international trade uh, and courses on export, linking export and entrepreneurship more common across universities. And they had uh, brought us for a meeting. So everyone who discussed that unfortunately was that uh, the whole talk was about entrepreneurship in the local market. There was really no focus on export itself when they were trying to design this course, which I found very surprising. So we do have, unfortunately, a lot of business schools even in Pakistan, do have this bias when they teach students, they teach about the local market, that you go and sell in the local market you and you make money, you are happy. The thing is, there's a lot involved in exporting that is different, as Gonzalo said. Export is a different ball game, And we need the entrepreneurships need to have that mindset as well. They need to be told earlier on that exporting is a different ball game. So when you start a business, you should, if you want to export, you need to start thinking about exporting at the initial stages not at the latter stages that once you have a successful pro uh, product here, you can't go and just sell it in China or in Dubai. You'll have a lot of restrictions on that. And that needs to be told to people. So exporting bias that we have, the anti-export bias that we have, we are against it. That is prevalent even in the way that we teach our uh, uh, budding entrepreneurs. And I think this is where universities need to make international trade. When you talk about international trade and exports, and entrepreneurship, when they think that, they need to bring this out, that exporting is a different ball game and it needs a lot more information, a lot more knowledge on export processes, which unfortunately our entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs are not taught in that way. So TDAP has a very interesting program here, a very relevant program, the National Exporter Training Program, and it was with, in collaboration with IDA. And that is a lot of that. So I actually say that they should, even trade associations should have those pro kind of programs. So think about, teach about exports to budding, budding entrepreneurs so that they can target export markets at a very young stage of the business, not uh, do it once they are five years, 10 years down the line when they then can't because they have to change, change the whole product line as Gonzalo mentioned. So that's one point I wanted to add. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, folks. I think this has been a great discussion. Gonzalo, we must continue this. We must have more of these because I can see there's a lot of issues that need to be discussed, a lot of issues that we need to understand and focus on. Even today, I find there are too many issues that we have still not explored, and we should, inshallah, we will. Um, somebody said it right, there's a Parkinson's law at work now, everywhere in the world, Parkinson's law said that the more bureaucracy you have, the more control you will have. And I think we are seeing that everywhere. Um, when I was young, for example, I could go anywhere in Europe without any problem, but today I can't go anywhere. I mean, it's just absolutely absurd, the kind of bureaucratic problem that you face. And Manzoor Saab said it very well. Yeah, there are um, there is histories that can be used, but we don't use them. U.S. uses history very well. For example, U.S. has a global entry visa. Even I can get it. Everybody can get it. Global entry, but in sense, if you have, if you're a U.S. citizen or whatever, you can have global entry, which means you pay a hundred dollar fee and thereafter nobody checks you. You just walk in, just uh, swipe your card and move in. And the same thing is uh, Dubai does it, but we don't do it. So I come back to this. It's not that we have an anti-export bias, um, uh, Adil. I think we've got an, we an anti-consumer bias and I suffer from it every day. I am, as, as I mentioned, Khalid Hassan said, give us back our onions, that we will starve ourselves to give the best onions and mangoes to somebody else. We've got a pro-export bias. We've got a mercantilist bias, but we should debate this. We should debate this till the cows come home. We've got a huge mercantilist bias. When I was growing up, for example, I could get nothing. Everything had to be exported. Even today, our domestic consumer is at a disadvantage because we are running for export, exports. So you call it anti-export bias, I call it mercantilism, right? Because we are running for dollars. Instead, for example, why are we not allowing, I mean, if Bundu Khan wants to go outside, can you tell me what the export barriers are? Bundu Khan go out, can't go outside the country. Yet when Carrefour comes in, we subsidize Carrefour by giving it free land. So these are issues also that we need to examine. And I come back to my colleagues, Adil Saab, you. I come back to my colleagues at PID. Folks, the World Bank didn't need to do this study. You should have done it. And I blame our academia for absolutely not being able to lead the debate in our country. And that's why we are not successful. And that's why we are collaborating with the World Bank. There's so much work to be done. There's so much work to be done. 
Why, for example, let's take the Bundu Khan Car 4 study or the Al Fatah Car 4 study. Somebody should do a case study on this. Why is Car 4 not in London and DC and New York? Why is, sorry, Al Fatah? Why is Car 4 here? There are huge regulatory barriers, as you know. Anybody who wants to establish a business outside, ECC has to give them permission, State Bank has to give them permission, whereas the McDonald's can come here with no permission. So these are all issues that are trade related and we should take them up. It's not just trades in goods, it's trades in services, it trades in many, trade in many things. And our people, I don't think Adil Sabah agree with you, our people no export. We are the country that has managed to export manpower all over the world, despite the barriers. We break all the barriers. Illegal migration is very strong in Pakistan. I remember going to Belize and Mexico and Pakistani, I found Pakistanis there and they said, hey, we wanted to get into the US. We are waiting here. One day we'll break the barrier and get in there. Now, yes, illegal, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not trying to encourage illegal migration, but it's a form of entrepreneurship and a form of export uh, behavior. So lots of things to discuss, Gonzalo. I'm very happy. Thank you very much. We shall continue this discussion forward. The job, the point is to educate people and create a debate. Any last words, Gonzalo, from you? Yes, we will have another one in two weeks' time. It will be on the anti-export bias of tariff policy. So here we will have that debate earlier on. <laughs> I'll enjoy it. Good job, Gonzalo. Gonzalo you, might one, you might as well have one on services that Dr. Nadim's last point. Let's do that's, a, that's a great idea. We'll, we'll do that too. Okay, have on services. Thank you very much. I appreciate all of you turning up. Thank you. Khuda Hafiz. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you for your Thank comments. you very much Thank to you. the ITC. Thank you, Dr. Sameed. Thank you for... Thank you very much. Wherever Thank you, you are. Good evening. Khuda Hafiz.